Good afternoon, my fellow scientists. I am Dr. Peter Allen. I have been working for the last year and a half on a crowdfunded all iron battery, and I'd like to share with you today a little introduction to how that works and also the build instructions in case you want to build one of your own. So what is an all iron battery? An all iron battery is a battery with an iron anode, such as steel wool, and an iron cathode, such as an iron three salt like iron three sulfate. Iron 3 is the highly oxidized form of iron, and iron metal is the reduced form. When they balance each other out, they go to iron 2, and so you can have the whole battery made of iron. The good things about this battery are it's a water-based chemistry, so it's fairly safe. It's not going to catch on fire. It is fairly non-toxic. The ingredients are not going to cause problems for the people building it or for the environment. It is also uh, not uh, strongly acidic or basic and iron is extremely abundant. So just how abundant is iron? Well, compare it to lithium. Total world production lithium is something like 40,000 tons per year. Total world production of iron pier is on the order of 2 billion tons per year. It's in a class of its own as far as mineral production worldwide. So if iron is such a great and abundant chemistry for batteries, why haven't people done it? And the answer is the iron is relatively heavy. It's not going to have a very high specific energy. So it's going to take a lot more battery to power the same amount of stuff. So take, for example, a little compact car. Compact car is going to run on gasoline, holds maybe 12 gallons, goes about 300 miles. That's about mm, less than 100 pounds of, of gasoline for 300 miles of travel. A similar electric car is going to have something like a 600 pound battery and it's going to go something like 150 miles. So even lithium ion batteries in something like the Nissan LEAF require a lot heavier energy storage pack to get the job done. Now contrast that to iron. To hold a similar amount of energy, you're going to need something like 10, 20, 30 times the mass. So now instead of having a gas tank that fits nicely below the cab, you have a battery pack that takes up half of the trailer. That's really not great for mobile applications. But for stationary applications, that changes. So if your battery's holding still, then weight is a lot less of an issue. Why don't we have big battery packs storing energy? Well, because until recently, the cheapest form of energy was gonna be fossil fuels, and fossil fuels are sort of pre-stored. There's no need to burn a fossil fuel, generate electricity, store that electricity, and then use it later. Just don't burn the fuel until you need it. Things have changed. Solar electricity is now the cheapest electricity money can buy. Mexican solar electricity, where the sun is shining, is going to run something like two cents per kilowatt hour. That's more than 10 times cheaper than some places in the United States. So when you have cheap energy available and you can store it and sell it when it's needed, that's called energy arbitrage. And it's going to be a bigger and bigger factor in our energy economy as solar electricity gets even cheaper and new battery technologies like the all iron battery come online. So how well do these batteries perform? An array of six of these cells can store about 600 milliamp hours at two volts over 150 grams of mass of the battery. It's about 25 times lower specific energy than a lithium ion battery. But again, for stationary applications, it may be just the ticket. How do we build one of these? We're going to start by making the membrane. So you're going to fold the membrane into a little pouch just big enough to fit inside one of these pill pouches. So I got something like 10 by 5 centimeters in half and then fold the wings in about one centimeter each to make the paper pouch. That's going to become the separator, but to make it into an efficient separator, we need to treat it with a polymer. In this case, we're going to use the super sorber sodium polyacrylate polymer. It doesn't take much, a few milligrams, and then hydrate with a lot of deionized water and stir until it is dissolved. Pour that into the paper pouch until it is saturated. You can use a plastic spacer to hold the shape. That'll also help it not stick to the glass dish in which it's located. That dish then goes into a drying oven. Drying oven is set to a modest temperature and it's allowed to dry for a day or two. 
With the membrane drying, we're going to make a one molar solution of potassium sulfate. So you're going to weigh out the appropriate mass of potassium sulfate and then hydrate that using a heated stir plate. So once the appropriate mass is weighed out, add a stir bar, add the appropriate volume of water. We're not being quantitative here, we're just getting close. Stir that and warm it until we have a solution of potassium sulfate. Now we're going to weigh out iron 2 chloride. We're going to make about 10 mils of a 1 molar solution of iron 2 chloride in that potassium sulfate solution. So get a volume of the potassium sulfate, we're going to add that to the weighed mass of iron 2 chloride, and we're going to end up with an iron sulfate solution with some chloride spectator ions. We're going to change the pH of that, lower the pH meter probe into that solution, and add 10 molar sodium hydroxide until we reach a pH of about 7.5. You can see that the color is going to change when that happens. That's okay, that's expected. We're going to precipitate a lot of our iron, but it is still seemingly available for redox reactivity, so that's just fine. We're going to repeat the same procedure with iron 3 chloride. So we're going to make a mass of iron 3 chloride and then hydrate that to a final concentration of about 1 molar. Once you have the appropriate mass of iron 3 chloride, then we're going to get a volume of the same potassium sulfate solution, about 10 mils, and add that to the appropriate mass of iron 3 chloride to generate the iron 3 sulfate solution. That's going to go at the cathode. Now again, we're going to adjust the pH with 10 molar sodium hydroxide until we get to something like a neutral pH 7.5. Again, that's going to precipitate. It starts off very acidic at pH 2 to 3. We're going to have to use a lot of sodium hydroxide to get there. Once you have a pH roughly 7.5 anode and cathode electrolyte, we're going to weigh out some iron metal, so that's just steel wool in this case, and add that pre-made polymer impregnated membrane pouch to a plastic baggie. In this case, it's just a pill pouch we ordered on Amazon. With that inside the baggie, you can carefully work your iron metal into that pouch along with a graphite foil current collector. You want to put the little wings of that pouch toward the back and the flat side of the paper toward the front. The front is also going to have the cathode current collector and the cathode graphite electrode. That's a graphite foil and a graphite felt that's going to soak up the catholite. And now it's ready to add the electrolyte. So you take your pre-made iron to salt. We're going to add that around the iron metal. As you can see, that's going to go in there with the steel wool. Once the steel wool is saturated with its electrolyte, we're going to saturate the carbon electrode with the iron 3 salt. Just work to work it into all the nooks and crannies. Here's the iron 3 salt. That is going to go into the graphite felt in the other compartment. One of the little tricks is you want to make sure that you wet that interface between the membrane and the carbon felt. That interface needs to be nice and moist to make a good connection. Second little trick is you want to make sure that those two graphite foil current collectors don't touch one another or else it shorts the battery. So you want to be real careful about that. Each cell is going to produce roughly 0.5 volts. Initially, right after hydrating, it starts off a little low, 0.35 volts. But after the electrolyte soaks through that separator, it, it increases modestly. And of course, it has a reasonably high internal resistance, and so you get a little bit of a voltage drop under load as well. Once we assembled six of those, we put them in series in this green box, binder clipped the current collectors together, and then connected it up to that green LED, as well as to a logging voltmeter and a logging ammeter to collect the performance data over the course of several hundred hours.
Thank you all for tuning in. Hope that's been interesting. And if you do decide to build a iron cell of your own, I hope you'll let me know in the comments or at my website, peterallenlab.com. Special thank you to Nico who collected all of that construction footage as well as a great deal of work this summer getting that exact procedure ironed out to build one of these. Uh, again, I want to thank our crowd funders who have made all this possible. In particular, I've got a list of our donors who donated at least $100, which really made this project possible. So special thank you to those donors, Jim Kaspar, Kor, Power, Thomas, Golson, Prahasith Velavolu, Dwight Irving, John Palin, Magnus Van Stensen, Greg Thompson, Rob Farley, Michael Clark, James Schreiner, Leah and Daniel Fry, Eric Bennett, Brad Allen, Scott Kerr, Woody Peterson, Matthias Persson, Thomas Clark, Justin Phelps, Pavel Denisov, Kurt Liedl, Matthew Ernst, Dirk Elmendorf, TJ and Kara Mothersbaugh, Paul James and Charles Barnaga. Thank you all very much for making this summer a success and for making this all possible. I really appreciate all of your kind support. To those who contribute to other amounts, you can expect to receive your rewards as I make them possible. Uh, you'll get your copies of the final document as soon as it's complete and will get acknowledged in the paper and in the credits here. Thank you again, and we will keep updating as we get further along right here in the Allen Lab.